Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come in, have a seat, get comfy. It's just next to the sliding library ladder and right below the shelf titled Queer Fairy Tale Retellings. Pick a book, your favourite book. That's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a really towering to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am a figment of your imagination. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns, and I am the kraken awaiting your blood sacrifice. We've been friends for 10 years and are always swapping books. But despite having the same taste in books, we never get round to reading each other's recommendations. It's always just another book on the pile. It's a seriously big pile now. It might crush me in my sleep. So, each month we're going to force each other to read a book. The new reader will give a blind summary of the book, then we'll both go away and read it, and then when we've both read it, we'll return to chat about it. So this week, let's get to talking about... Peter Darling by Austin Chant. So, Morgan, Mm -hmm. tell us all about Peter Darling. So, Peter Darling by Austin Chant is a sequel slash retelling of Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. It is a trans retelling where Peter and Wendy are the same person and Peter is a trans man. And it's also a bit of enemies to lovers romance between Peter and Hook and just an all around great vibe. I discovered it ages ago because it came out in 2017 and I saw it on one of those Tumblr lists of like trans characters in fiction and then it was just completely out of print for like years and so I finally found it when it went into reprint last year and I read it during Freshers Week and just could not put it down. I was literally at my table at the Fresher stall at uni just reading it whilst there was no one at the table just going, I need to finish it. Oh my God. Shall we listen to my first impressions it's like before your first impressions my pre-impression your pre-impressions i'm very curious i'm very curious to listen to this so what do i know about peter darling by austin chant uh i think the answer is very little much like morgan with dark and deepest red last time i know that it's a peter pan retelling and i know that it has a trans male character in it because i found it on a list of them when i was looking a long time ago and i think that quite possibly it involves Wendy and Peter actually being the same person and Peter, Wendy like transitioning and then becoming Peter if that makes sense. So I'm not entirely sure if that's true. That's that's my guess I suppose. And um, I'm looking at the cover but it leaves a lot to the imagination. It seems like Peter's gonna fly off the Jolly Roger at some point and maybe fight a Kraken. So that's fun. I believe the Kraken might actually be trying to consume Neverland now that I'm looking more closely at it. So that's a lot more action than I, I guess, was expecting. <laughs> I don't really know anything about the plot or the plot beats, so I guess I'm gonna have to find out. So we basically, word for word, said the exact same thing. <laughs> that was, I mean, okay, I didn't know about the enemies to lovers aspect. I will say that out the gate. That took me completely by surprise in the best way possible. (laughs) I did not know that that was a feature (laughs) of this book. Yeah, I I like your review of the cover because this is the reprint cover because it was originally like very blank cover, very like blue and green vibey, whereas now it's got actual pictures on it. Yeah, it sort of has that sort of old woodcut impression that is kind of Mm. evocative of the original Peter Pan, which is quite nice. Yes. And I think it's Tink on the the D in Darling, the sort of embellished D, which is very cute. Oh, I hadn't noticed that. Oh my god. She's very small, but I think that is her. That's so cute. Speaking of Tink, fairies in this world. I absolutely love how Chant characterises fairies in this world. It's so much fun. I love their weird insectoid vibes. I love their hive mind. It's fantastic. Many eyes, many legs, furry... Literally, what more could you want? What more could you want? And I thought that that was kind of an interesting, I don't know, jumping off from the original. In the in the original, they have kind of a weird thing going on in the actual text, but not to this extent. But I remember that they have, like, gendered glows, which I always thought was a bit oh. weird. But they have a non-binary gendered glow as well, which is also interesting. I did not, I literally just re-listened to it and did, did not catch that. Do you not that. remember the gendered glows, Morgan, the most important <laughs> aspect of Peter Pan? <laughs> I just remember them describing her as like curvy and very much like she's a voluptuous woman kind of vibe and being like, okay, interesting choice. Um, Yeah. Why? (laughs) 
but making them insects i think was a fun move and yes i think it's also a very interesting move given that you're getting an older peter's neverland and how his imagination of it might have changed as he grew up Ooh, that's a good point the sort of stereotypical fairy description is just teeny tiny human woman there is that sort of trope in fantasy of it's humanoid but slightly different it's humanoid but longer it's humanoid but shorter it's humanoid but they glow and it's I... humanoid but long is that elves yeah <laughs> i mean you're not wrong so i think it's really interesting to be like actually let's make them a bit more alien a bit more other let's make them vibey let's make them insects let's talk about the gay let's talk about the gay it's extremely gay <laughs> One of my first notes is we are only 41 pages in, and here we have a sore to throat homosexual moment. <laughs> That's the truly iconic moment. That's the, like, oh, it's this, it's it's gay gay. It's very much the whole, like, I feel so much towards this person, it must be hatred. It must be hatred. Like, oh, I just, I hate his so blue eyes, I hate his curly hair, I hate his <laughs> beautiful clothes. His stupid moustache. <laughs> Also, chapter two has the quote, Peter took a step forward, liking the way Hook's eyes followed him. And I was like, (laughs) excuse me, we've literally just, this is like the first appearance of Hook. And I do love how like unashamed it is, but it just fully leans into the enemies to lovers trope. Like this is somebody that's clearly having so much fun with it as an author. And Mm. I was having so much fun with it as a reader. It's very much just like, it has that fan fiction vibe, which we all love. It does. When we have like enemies to lovers in literary fiction, it's always very much like towing the line. It's almost very much mm. like, but they're not really enemies and or but they never really hurt each other. Or there's some weird power dynamic that is just a bit gross. Yeah. But specifically here, they are on such an equal playing field and they really, they do understand each other. And like, you know, we love a good trope of no one else matters in this world, only it's literal. Literally, they are the only two people in the world, apart from Ernest, but Ernest is just out there being gay on his own. He's fine. I felt a bit bad for <laughs> Ernest. I was like, well, he's obviously also in love with Peter. There's only two people in the entire world and both of them are in love with Peter. That's another thing I really like. This is very clearly a love letter to being trans, making the only two real people in the entire world attracted to the main character who is trans and who doesn't see himself as attractive like there's that line where hook is like irritated that he doesn't think peter knows he's attractive yes I and i just that. think that that's so it makes me feel so many things okay the passage that i i want to read it's when peter puts on the crown yes and hook is like um, it suits you, he wanted to say, against all his better instincts, the crown made Pan look like a lazy young god, his curly hair spilling out under and over the golden rim. His eyes matched the jaws and they're gleaming. Prince of runaways hooked thought and caught his breath and look, looked away. Just... That was very good. Uh, just the trope of, like, the lazy prince with, like, the crooked crown is such a trope in, like, especially, like, YA kind of things of, like, very much like the heterosexual love interest it's always like oh this very like dark and mysterious prince who like wears his crown very jauntily and sort of appropriating that and taking that yeah ascribing it to a transmasculine character is a lot of fun like this just, just this image is very gender and the fact that he literally is a god of this world i think is quite fun like i am one who I do go through AO3 looking at the overpowered tag because I love a good overpowered exploration. I think it's so interesting. And so to actually like explore that and to sort of have this vibe and like just the way that Peter has described, very gender, very good, very vibes. I absolutely loved how they continued to play with that, especially as it became more and more clear that Neverland was a figment of Peter's imagination primarily. The pathetic fallacy coming in later was so much fun. Yes. Pathetic fallacy, my beloved. Especially when Hook is convinced for a good, like, 20, 30 pages that Neverland is trying to kill him. And the Queen is like, hun, no. No, this is just your boyfriend. Your boyfriend is just so overpowered and has a great imagination, so he decided that he's in charge of the weather now. But yeah, and, uh, like, stuff like the dream sort of skipping, like, the bit where he talks about skinning a rabbit, but then he realises he doesn't know how to skin a rabbit. Just the way that the world building is created and like you slowly slip in things like the fact that John and Michael are similar to Slightly and Curly, slipping little things in more and more to be like, 
maybe something's going on here. The fact that Hook knew the entire time and Peter didn't. Oh, that was also really good. Hook's like, oh, sorry to break it to you. <laughs> Hook's it's... like, we've just been playing Dungeons and Dragons this entire time. <laughs> but you, every time I've killed one of your NPCs, you've been like, this is a real, this is a real murder. That, the whole murder thing was so interesting to me. The fact that Peter's like, no, the pirates aren't people. No, they're just figments of the story. As soon as one of the Lost Boys is killed, Peter suddenly is like, you killed somebody. I do wonder if it would surprise people who haven't read the original Peter Pan, because mm. I suppose people have the Disney version in mind, but there's so much murder in the original that I think if people haven't read it... I mean, this was your first time reading the original as well, right? Mm. Yeah, so I think I read it as a kid, and I just do not remember it. Because I saw some reviews on Goodreads being like, oh, this is so it's such a disservice to the original, you know, it's very like out of character. And as I was listening to the book, I was like, it's very in character, honestly. There's so much murder and violence. And like, there's this implication that Peter kills off the Lost Boys when they get too old. <laughs> That's just never mentioned again. Yeah, so that was really interesting to sort of transfer it onto this. And there's honestly not that much murder in this one. Yeah, there's less murder comparatively, but I also thought it was really interesting that it became something that he like equated with his masculinity. It was like a very immature, I guess, concept of masculinity. Like, oh, obviously this is what I want to do because this is what men do, is like fight and kill mm. each other and stuff. Whereas there was Ernest and Hook who were like enjoying Neverland because they were able to not do those toxic masculinity things in that they were queer men who experienced their masculinity differently to what was the norm where you, you know, go do your boxing match at the end of the day of being a gentleman to get all of your manly urges out or whatever it was <laughs> but <laughs> but because Peter yeah. didn't have an outlet for that at all because he was a closeted trans man of course when he gets an opportunity to play with fantasy he does as much masculinity as he can which is cramming as much violence in as possible before he's like well hang mm. on maybe this is bad actually mm. one one trope that this has that I am obsessed with is reintroducing yourselves when you're when you become on a level playing field so that you can finally yes. move forward into a romantic relationship. The reintroducing trope is genuinely one of my favourite things in literature of all times, second only to the runaway with me scene that we get in so many queer narratives. I mean, we, we kind of get that here too, honestly. We do. Honestly, it's a one-two punch. I mean, they're really so is. immediately ride or die for each other, which I do, or at least hook for Peter. Peter's a bit more like, hang on a sec, I didn't even know I could be gay five seconds ago, give me a sec. The reintroduction scene that you mentioned is really touching as well because you get James introducing himself as James, James Hook. Mm. But when Peter introduces himself as Peter, Hook doesn't question it at all, which I thought was really sweet because it's this thing of they are living in this fantasy world and Hook is trying to get information about Peter's past and mm. he wants to go back into the real world by the end of the novel. He realises that like they can't live in this strange fantasy for the rest of their lives. But when Peter says his name is Peter, he's not like, I'm going to question that further or push for a surname or anything. He just accepts that. And also speaking of tropes, there's mm -hmm. a wound care scene. There's multiple there wound care scenes. There is a wound care. There's a mul Yes. We are Absolutely. two for two. We're also two for two on scenes where there's coitus in the forest for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> what is it with fairy tale retellings and coitus in the forest? <laughs> I don't know. I have a question. Go for it. If you woke up and you found yourself in a fantasy land where everything you wished was true, yes. would you bother leaving? Because I'm going to be honest, the entire time of the novel, when Hook's like, oh my god, I need to go home, it stole my whole life from me, I'm like, I, I would stay. Like, it seems so much yeah. more chill. Like, okay, yeah, no one else is real, but now you two are real. You've got each other. I remember thinking if there's like one criticism that I would have, it would maybe be that there wasn't enough appeal for into real life. Like I appreciate that this is sort of a mental illness metaphor and an escapism metaphor. You know, both of them have very self-destructive tendencies throughout. But especially with the understanding that they're going back to like Victorian England, and mm. especially with there being a risk that they might not even be together when they go back and that mm. they would have to find each other again. It's just so dangerous and depressing, the alternative to Neverland. And I could see that, like, okay, maybe Neverland has, like, no challenges. It's that sort of the end of the good place thing. It's what is the mm. end of the good place. Where, you know, if everything's perfect all the time, then eventually it's just going to become completely monotone. But they have been introducing challenges to Neverland because of the way that it works. If they want challenge, it gives them challenge. They even make a joke about that, where Peter says, can't he just wish an exit so that they can get out? And then Hook says, that's kind of not really in the spirit of the thing, is it? And then they mm. just keep going. So, you know... 
And like, I think it's interesting that Hook is so adamant about leaving because like he left the real world because of grief, but he was, you know, an autonomous adult. He had his own house, you know, he could do his own thing. Whereas Peter is so adamant to stay because he's never had any autonomy of his own. And they are going back to very different things. I don't think Hook quite understands that. But like the reality that Peter left was awful. Like Neverland, in fact, is better than when where he was. Completely agree with that. Especially, you're right with the with the grief aspect of it. You know, hanging around with a weird simulacrum of your dead boyfriend is probably not a good idea for your mental health. Mm. So, Hook <laughs> coming out of it does seem like a healthy thing. But in comparison, yeah, what's Peter gonna do? At the end of the day, Hook is a cis man. Like he Basically. has a lot more autonomy in the world. By implication, he's a financially independent cis man with, you know, his own house, his own land, his own career as an artist. He does seem to be far more privileged, basically, I suppose, than Peter. Mm, yeah. But during their fight scene, not fight, but like, because they're not in the same place, but like Peter is fighting Hook with the weather. So, you know, yes. but the fact that they go to each other's spaces in hopes of finding each other, like Peter goes to the cave because he hopes that Hook will come and find him. Whereas Hook goes to the mountain because that's the only place he can think of that Peter would go. That's true. Like we understand each other kind of moment. That was very sweet. I did like that a lot. Speaking of the cave, I also, I just loved Hook's passion for clothes so much. I thought that was really fun. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, seriously, let's look at these boots. Seriously. I feel like that's one of those traits that people are hesitant to give gay characters because they are like worried about leading into the stereotype. But it was just really fun to have a gay man who's just so into his clothes and it was like not framed as embarrassing or anything. And of course his fantasy would be full of fantastic clothes. It was clothes adventure and a worthy opponent. Who could ask for more? I mean, I'm I'm on this guy's side. Absolutely. <laughs> and the fairy tale cottage that they have at the end is good. The fact that it was dusty, I was very glad of. Because I was like, Hook's been gone a while. If this house isn't screwed, then I don't understand the magic system here. So I really appreciated them waking up and immediately sneezing and immediately being like, wow, this has been reclaimed by nature. But also they're used to that because they've been sleeping on the floor for the past 15 years. I really appreciated how both of them were different in the real world. Hook is yeah. not the same person in Neverland as he is in the real world. And sort of Peter recognising that he isn't the only one who's been putting on this grand persona. Also, the fact that Peter has manners in the real world was quite funny. Like the pleases and thank yous just suddenly <laughs> popping out as soon as yeah. he's in the real world. I like that a lot. And I, I always love when fiction explores that like idealised self versus actual self and the mm. the rift between that, but also the similarities between that. And that was, that was done very well, even though it was like a brief period of time to do it in because it was only the last chapter, I think. Yeah, I would read a whole sequel about them trying to acclimatise to real life. Oh, absolutely. And just living their cottagecore dream as an artist and a writer. Peter's going to repeatedly jump off things because he still thinks that he can fly. <laughs> yeah, speaking of the flying, the fact that he has fairy dust in his blood, I thought was really cool. There was one thing, though, that I got so excited about and then it didn't happen, which is when they're talking about fairy dust and fairy dust having healing properties. They talk about how Peter's blood activates the rune things and Hope's doesn't. And then Hook is injured, and then they're outside, and then Peter goes, oh no, you need fairy dust to heal, and then he goes and gets some fairies. And I was like, why doesn't he just use his blood? I appreciate that maybe that's not how it works, but the drama of that scene would have been great, and they'd set it up perfectly, and then it just doesn't happen, and I was very upset. You could have a whole, like, Phoenix Tears thing of, like, Peter, like, crying over the wound, and then it healing. Maybe he could even kiss the wound, we could have a little bit of a Steven Universe moment. It'd probably be in a spit, which is kind of gross. I mean, the same thing happens at the end of Tangled, so... Morgan, who was your favourite character? Um, Peter. I would steal that man's gender in a second. Can I ask, did you have a gender interview for Peter as a child? Because I did. And I'm wondering if this is like a universal experience. I think so. I think just completely how unhinged he is. Like, I'm always a sucker for unhinged characters to begin with. And his complete refusal to believe in things he doesn't want to believe in. Again, it's the lazy god image. It's the spilling curls over the crown. I'm like, absolutely. Give me that, please. What about you? I think it was Peter marginally. I did also really like Hook, though. I just mm. I had a soft spot for him. I liked that he was a bit more chill. I felt like I could maybe relate to him a bit more personality-wise, <laughs> even though I did still enjoy Peter's complete unhingedness. I do need to give a shout out to Tink because 
I thought she was so interesting. The fact that she had grey hair and she was old and she was still like, I'm going to support you. And the fact that she just became friends with Hook whilst Peter was gone and they just commiserated about how annoying he was. I would love more content of the two of them bad-mouthing Peter behind his back. Ashley the Fairy Queen as well. Can we can we get a moment to appreciate her? Because she was also extremely cool. She Very cool. was kind of there to deliver exposition. She had such gravitas that it was okay. Very regal. Very vibey. Very much just like, oh, you two again. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus Christ. These gays are ruining my entire kingdom with their pining. Could you not? Could you take it to the real world, please? <laughs> Yeah, you know what? If anything, I feel like maybe the Queen should have been more enthusiastic about them leaving. I mean, I know she was already enthusiastic, but I feel like this should have been like her entire plot line <laughs> of them, her just being like, can you please get out because you are going to tear Neverland to shreds? You know, maybe even that could have been a reason for them to have to leave, you know? Mm-hmm. Neverland is a shelter for people that need it, but if you guys stay, you're going to tear it to shreds. You need to leave so that other people can come, can use it mm-hmm. before you literally tear it to shreds with your gay yearning for each other. Oh, I do have to talk about another scene, actually. Oh, absolutely go for it hook and Ernest in the cave but mainly because like i find it so interesting when a character's like you know you're not real right and then i love how the boys react to that of just like wow hook told Ernest that we're not real bit of a bummer um anyway <laughs> and like hook's realization and just that oh oh you too <sighs> Oof. I'm amazed that Hook didn't pick up on it earlier because I feel like Ernest coming in and influencing all of the Lost Boys to stop being murderous, mm. mindless creatures and telling them about like democracy and peace negotiations <laughs> was kind of like a dead giveaway that this was like a person with a brain and not just like another figment of Peter's imagination. But you know, Hook yeah. had been there for a while. I feel like he was also starting to get a bit fuzzy on the whole real, not real thing. So mm. you can you can forgive him this slip, but it was it was a good scene. Definitely. Definitely. Soren, what did you think of this book that I introduced you to? There are right answers only. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed this book. Um, I loved, I just had so much fun with it. I will say that I read this so quickly. I wasn't feeling that well and I knew that I was kind of a bit behind in the days that I had to read it. So I lay down and I was like, I'm going to read one chapter of it just to get ahead of myself. And then I read the entire thing. I was definitely entranced. You know, if you want an adventure that you will enjoy every word of, I think this is definitely a book that you should read. I think, rating-wise, you might be offended, I would probably also give this four stars. And the pure reason is just, I didn't feel like they had enough incentive to leave at the end. Like, I just feel like Mm -hmm. the meta-narrative could have been neater. Like, character development-wise and character relationship-wise, it was fantastic, it was perfect. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. in terms of them coming to terms with their own situations and their own will to live I suppose I felt like it Mm. needed a little bit more thought yeah I mean coming from you a four is very good so I'll take it (laughs) I'll take it I unsurprisingly rated this a five out of five the first time I read it and the second time I read it um I just I just had a lot of fun yeah I just really enjoyed it and I think it was just so unapologetic and so vibey and I haven't read that many books with trans main characters which actually sort of talk about it and I just it was just so fun and it was so vibey and we love a good enemies to lovers arc so five out of five from me for people who have enjoyed this book what would you recommend I am going to recommend Every Heart a Doorway by Shana Maguire it's the first in a series of books but you don't have to read them in any particular order which is about portal fantasy and sort of what happens afterwards and I just think the sort of fairy tale but for grown-ups vibe is the same they're roughly the same length I think every house door is a bit shorter it's also got a trans male character in it who has sort of similar vibes to Peter I think just gives off the same energy like same book different font and also got a lot of violence that you're not expecting that just comes out of nowhere <laughs> and you're like oh dear people are dying why are they dying what about you? If you enjoyed Peter Darling, you might also enjoy The Kingdoms by Natasha Pilly. It's got a very different feel, but if you enjoyed the sort of charged romance in Peter Darling, the enemies to lovers trope, the is this person going to kill me or are they going to make out with me <laughs> situation, and also the touch of historical setting and how queer characters function in a historical setting, I will say that it has not got any trans characters at the forefront it has one who's in the background who isn't handled fantastically she's not mishandled but she's just 
very much a side character. So next time we're going to be talking about Sister Song by Lucy Holland. I'm very excited to make you read this. I'm very excited to read this. It was one of my favourite books last year. Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to give the cat a scratch on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Planar Prod. On this episode, you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Briarwood discussing Peter Darling by Austin Chant. You can find out more about this book at austinchant.com, and you can follow Chant at sachant on Twitter. July is Historical Fiction Month at The Hidden Bookcase. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, 4th of July, we'll be discussing Sister Song by Lucy Holland. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase.